All right, another night where there's nowhere to go, nothing to do, and no one to look up to. All the great podcast themes have been turned into podcast theme parks, and I don't know about you, but... Hello, baby, I've been waiting for a Christian Slater podcast. Welcome back to the amazing Christian Slater Monitor. I'm Oswald Ramirez, and this is... Reno Carson. Or so you remembered. There you go. And today yeah. we're talking about pump up the volume. I literally hate this movie. So <laughs> it's everything that I hate in one. You know when you watch something about teenagers, usually Euphoria, or you watch Gossip Girl, or any movie about teenagers or something. It's very clear usually that it's written by adults for teens, or even for adults. You know, it's written by people who are between like 40 and 70 years old or something. Because everyone wants to watch a movie with like beautiful people at like the peak of their physical attractiveness. But like they want them to have like the mind of adults because teenagers are the most boring and like idiotic people on earth. Like no one would want to watch a movie like actually that was like truly about teenagers this movie felt like it was actually like written by teenagers that's one of the things that i wanted to point out about the movie go ahead please (laughs) it felt like it was written by teenagers for adults it reminds me of something that like a play that like teenagers would write for like drama class in high school or something Um, and you did not like that about it no i i did not i hated it it was like i hate I hate super earnestness. I hate maudlin sentimentality. I watched Buffalo 66 kind of recently, which was my favorite movie my whole life. And I watched it as an adult and I hated it so much. <laughs> but like, <laughs> this is like a movie that I would have hated as a teenager too. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, I made detailed notes about the plot this time because I feel like a lot of people are going to be less familiar with the movie and you've only seen it once. Well, I saw it twice, actually. Oh, nice. I watched it again today because I fell asleep when I was watching it last How did you watch it? It was on like Internet Archive. Nice. So yeah, if you want to watch it, it's on Internet Archive. Okay, so the movie is from 1989. It's directed by Robert or Richard Moyle, uh, Alan Moyle, and written by Alan Moyle. I think the original title was supposed to be something like Talk Hard, and they re- <laughs> retitled it Pump Up the Volume. And it was offered to, what's his face, John Cusack, who turned it down. Then the very next person they offered it to, I guess, was Christian Slater, who said yes. And they were psyched because he was hot at the time, they say. That was smart of John Cusack to turn down this role. Well, then, so we have Christian Slater in the role. And it's written and directed by Moyle, and it seems to have a big, uh, a lot of people behind the scenes, mostly from music videos, and also from the crew of the film Sex Lies videotape, including, did you notice the score was by Cliff Martinez? No, I don't know who that is. He was the original or one of the drummers or something for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and he would go on to score many of the Steven Soderbergh movies, and now is one of the biggest, like, scorers in Hollywood. I've been watching... Rewatching the Nick, where he does the score, which is Steven Soderbergh, but he's very famous for having done the score to Drive, which I think a lot of people enjoy the synthy sounds. I haven't seen Drive either. I don't know. This was not a synthy score. The reason this movie isn't probably more seen or more available is because of all the crazy songs in it. There are a lot of, if I'm not wrong, like Leonard Cohen songs and God, I don't know what else. The Pixies. I'm trying to like go back over the. Well, they show you so many track. tapes of things like Bad Brain and things like that you're such a music person i thought you would have some kind of input on well in 1989 the kinds of tapes and things we see in the guy's room and the things he's playing the beastie boys song you can't find oh the descendants what's funny is like okay another thing is when i was younger i was like a huge music person like both my parents are well were anyway music industry people loosely but as i get older I dated this guy like a long time ago and he told me that he hates music. Like this was probably when I was like in my late twenties and this guy was like, I hate music. And like the only thing that he listened to was Jimmy Buffett. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Like a psychopath or something. But now I kind of hate music too. Like I find that as I get older, I have this weird kind of like, I don't know, just weird anhedonia. Like I don't, like nothing sounds good to me. I don't really like movies. I don't really like music. I don't really like TV shows. It's 
weird. So it's hard to put myself back into like a time where I was like really into music. Wow. You know, it's going to make this rough. I was really looking forward to talking about all the music in this movie with you and I will continue (laughs) to. Okay. So let's get, we'll get into the plot. Begin spoilers. It opens with the sun setting on a suburban Arizona town. Seems like a pretty white bread, affluent town, really. Would you say this town is uh, nicer or less nice than the one you grew up in? God, I don't know. I was going to say like, I kind of relate to the town. Okay. I tell the kind the of town, town I am. <laughs> that's the, the kind of town I imagine you growing up in is this kind of town. I grew up in a slightly I, less nice town. Like it's not, I didn't grow up in a shitty town, but not as fancy as this. But the one thing I will say is I grew up in Albuquerque. I still live here. But the thing is, um, I, Albuquerque is, I don't know, that town looked really like a strip mall kind of yeah. place, like an upscale Scottsdale kind of like yes. Albuquerque is very touristy it's just like a more beautiful city in general to do here it's prettier in my opinion than than this town and this is a more affluent seeming school but I definitely identified with kind of their nothing to do ness except for to uh have angst and have pranks and things like to make a huge penis and run around with it at some point like as you see in the film this is the kind of thing yeah you might see have seen in my own time uh, sorry my dog is I like hear this. crying <laughs> oh. i'm probably gonna have to try to put him out because he won't don't but put him down The sun is setting on this town and we come up on a radio broadcast of someone named Happy Harry Hardon. The initials are HHH and it's Christian Slater's voice. Then, and he's kind of, he's setting up and he's talking about, what is he talking about? How there's nothing to do. He basically just says some stuff and then they don't show us anything else of it. They cut to the next day. I can't remember what he said, but it was just something, most of what he says is just like, everything is crazy. Everything is bad. (laughs) Everything sucks. Like that kind of, everything's crazy. Like you're not crazy. The world is crazy. Like shit like that. Do you think you would have thought this was cool or you have thought it was lame? I think I would have thought it was so lame. First of all, like my dad is a radio guy. Like he hosts a morning show. So I'm repulsed by um, something like that. So wow. yeah, it would not it would not be cool to me at all. Cut to the next morning and there's the school bus and there are kids passing along a tape of this happy Harry Hard on. Kids are making bootlegs, I guess, of the radio b- broadcasts. And they're passing it around. On the bus, we see briefly a guy we'll see later named Malcolm, who wears glasses and a sweater vest or some such. Kind of preppily, but not uh, cool dressed. Kind of kind of a nerdy looking guy, wouldn't you say? Yes. Would you have thought this was cool? Th- this could... Hell, uh, this movie came out when I was like nine. And I remember seeing the poster for it at the movie store right around the same time I was figuring out who... I was learning who Christian Slater was. And I so I think that this was... It had kind of come and gone from theaters, and I had this feeling, oh man, this had already come out and it's coming to video, and then it was rated R, and I knew I wouldn't be able to see it because my parents wouldn't have let me see it. And then some years went by, and I saw it, and I loved this movie. This is the kind of thing I would have wanted to do. I would have wanted to be Happy Harry Hard On, which is why we're doing this right now. These kind of things, (laughs) these kind of things, they would do a lot of these kind of things in this era, too, of people doing their own broadcasts of things was a big motif of children's entertainment as well. Like there was an episode of The Muppet Babies where they make their own TV shows. And even later, there would be a show called Home Movies that was about a a cartoon about a kid that makes his own movies and stuff at home. But the ideas of kids putting on their own show, I loved that so much when I was a little boy. I would eat those episodes up. I'm so surprised by how many people have this weird... I mean, podcasting is obviously proof of this, but I mean, it's just really surprising to me how many people I have met or something in life that are like, my dream job would be to be a DJ or like a radio person or do talk radio or something, which I think is really interesting. So so many people's fear is public speaking, but then so many other people dream is public speaking. And I think radio is, and I don't know, public speaking, but you don't have to be actually in front of people or see people. So kind of it nicer. doesn't activate the same. Everyone wants to talk and talk about themselves and stuff, but it's nerve wracking to actually do it in front of people, but you don't have to do that. This is a teen movie, but I really associate this more with being a tween. This is a kind of movie I really enjoyed. When I was probably like 14 or 13. And then I've carries on with nostalgia. Like I enjoyed it when we watched it. My favorite movie when I was a teenager was Buffalo 66. Gosh, what else did I love? I actually love 
old corny horror stuff, old Peter Jackson movies and stuff oh. like that, and like Dario Argento, you know, stuff you like when you're into film. I liked like Paul Thomas Anderson, that kind of stuff. When I was okay. like a tween, when I was a little bit younger than that, I like like Cruel Intentions really holds up to me. Scream is like, a really great teen movie. God, who's the guy who does like all the 80s teen movies? John, John Hughes. Hughes. Okay. Yeah, I like John Hughes and stuff. People talking about this movie that were in it and stuff, they were talking about how it was darker than the John Hughes movies to them, and so they were excited to be in it. It reminds me of an after-school special, but like, (laughs) okay, it reminds me of Saved by the Bell or something, but Saved by the Bell meets Greg or Rocky or something. Interesting. (laughs) Like a Saved by the Bell episode directed by Greg or Rocky. In a way. We get off the bus and we have uh, Paige gets dropped off by her dad. Paige is the preppy smart girl who's trying to get into Yale, played by Cheryl Pollock. And she's dropped off by her domineering father and greeted by kind of the burnout guy, right? Do you remember this guy? He's played by someone named Billy Morissette. No word on if he is related to Alanis at all. But Billy Morissette as Maz Mazzilli. The blonde oh, hair kid. The blonde yes. Guy? Yeah. What'd you think of this guy? I mean, you know, like in the 90s, these are just like stock. This is like the late 80s, I guess, but it sort of it feels more like the 90s. <laughs> just stock kind of characters that you would see from that time. This is something I wanted to point out when I was saying, like, what would you think of this, like, at the time, if it was 1989, is it kind of feels, even though it's very earnest and after school especially, The way the characters dress and the music feels almost ahead of its time. Like he's got all these grunge things and stuff around. There are multiple Soundgarden songs on the soundtrack, I think. Yeah, it definitely felt more like a 90s movie than an 80s movie, for sure. We meet Billy Morissette, who also, I looked him up and he was briefly married or was married for a time to Mara Tierney. Do you know who that is? Oh, yeah, I can think of her face. (laughs) But, like, I can't think of, like, any she's thing she's in right liar, now. Liar, Liar, and News face. Radio. Right, yeah, she's the mom. Yes. Liar, Liar. What do you think of her? Um, she's fine. I've always found her extremely attractive. And then we she's s- attractive. Then we see Samantha Mathis and her friend Janie, who uh, was an... A-, a lot of the... You know, you see these teen movies where a lot of people go on to a lot. A lot of the people in this movie didn't go on to be huge. Like almost, yeah, I mean, even arguably Christian Slater. Yes, now. yeah, yeah. Mathis, she's in a lot, but she's, I don't know, I haven't seen her in forever. She works, I believe, but I haven't seen her in anything since the 90s, I don't think. Yeah, I didn't really recognize, like, anyone from this movie from anything else. Samantha Mathis and her friends, a friend uh, who, Janie, they were looking at Paige. And then there's a girl named Cheryl, who, when she gets off the bus, she's accosted by this guy, Mer- Mr. Murdoch, who has a flat top and glasses and is a real disciplinarian, it seems. He has a real hard-ass uh, Vince Lombardi kind of look. Everyone in this school is pretty, all the um, staff are pretty, <laughs> pretty hardcore. So that's pretty much all we got out in the day. And then we go to, it's night again, and it's 10 p.m. And as 9.59 comes to 10 p.m., we get another Happy Harry Hardon uh, thing. Oh, and they go to Hubert H. Humphrey High. So the Happy Harry Hardon seems, let's see, you know, he's he's chosen this moniker. There's actually a school here called Hubert Humphrey, too. What do you know about Hubert H. Humphrey? Oh, God. What, like, wasn't he the guy? I don't remember, like, what year it was, but, like, he was, like, somebody that they, like, put up as, like, the presidential candidate that, like, no one wanted or something. From Minnesota, of course. He, okay, so he, well, here we get, a, like, we, we see all this. This is where we see a lot of his equipment. We see his iguana love, and he has a pet iguana. He has, he has fan mail around, and he talks about his hate for the boomers. And he has a, he holds a contest on how to kill his parents. And then we see the dad pressuring Paige about her Yale interview. She listens. We see the kids listening everywhere. And we see Malcolm typing a letter on how he's going to kill himself. And we find out that Harry is new in town. And we hear on the soundtrack, Everybody Knows by uh, Leonard Cohen. And then we hear the song Love and Comes in Spurts, Sometimes It Hurts, which I forget what guy does that song. Are you a fan of Leonard Cohen and the song Everybody Knows? Well, I love that song. I do love that song. But in general, I have mixed to negative feelings about Leonard Cohen. He's obviously a great songwriter, but just not always my cup of tea. But I do really like that song. Fair. What about Love Comes in Spurts? I don't know that song or really remember it. Wow. I liked that song too. 
I was thinking of the songs on the soundtrack. They were pretty much busting out two of the ones I liked the best, the earliest. Like a lot of the songs in the movie, I didn't know. Like I really like um, Descendants a lot, but I didn't even know the song that they played by Descendants. Yeah, a lot of it, like some of it's like bands I like and stuff, but not really music that I'm like super familiar with. Yeah, I was familiar with like Leonard Cohen, the Pixies and stuff, obviously, but. And as a teen, I had all the Beastie Boys albums and I never heard of that song. I didn't even remember him mentioning it in the movie. And it's like, it is some kind of unreleased song. Like he says, he takes a break and we meet his parents and we find out that his dad is a is the youngest school commissioner in the history of Arizona. And the dad is played by a ba- man named uh, Scott Powlin. And Mimi Kennedy plays the mom. Did you recognize the dad from anything? He's t- he's worked a ton over the years as a character actor. The only no. thing I really recognized him from is he's the drama teacher in another fave of mine, Teen Wolf, who says, I, I said mauve. You've never seen Teen Wolf? I don't think so. I think it's like, like Michael J. Fox. Yes. It, right? I don't know. Do you think Michael J. Fox would have been good in this movie? Yeah, actually. I agree. I kind of do. I think that um, John Cusack actually would have been better than Christian Slater, too. Oh, Cusack would have been good, too. The premise of this movie, like, isn't so bad. You know, I don't, I don't have like an issue with like the premise or anything. I just have an issue with the execution and sort of like the tone. So when he talks about being uh, the youngest, the dad talks about being the youngest school commissioner in the history of Arizona. The wife regrets him kind of losing his hippie ideals. He was kind of a fight the power, power to the people guy. And she says that she thinks the son, that Mark's unhappy here. Happy Harry Hardon's real name is Mark, Mark Hunter. And so Mark goes, Mark goes into his dad's office and spies around and he steals some kind of letter. And then his dad comes in and it's like, they have some back and forth. And his dad says, one of these days, you're going to outsmart yourself, young man. That could probably be, probably be said to any of the Christian Slater characters we'll encounter. You know, yeah. In this movie, they're going off about boomers. And yes. this movie is what, like 32 years old or three years old. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. 32, 32 years old. It's like. That's still what everyone is talking about. Wow, <laughs> the boomers that's true. Are like the boogeyman of this movie and like still are the boogeyman. It's weird. So I guess in this movie, his parents are boomers, presumably. Yeah, sure. I look at my mom's boss or something who has kids who are like 20 or something. <laughs> like it's just really weird. Boomers just like seem to go on and on and on and still have kids that are like pretty young. Mm-hmm. They were the parents of teenagers like 32 years ago. There's still some boomers that are like parents of teenagers now. Yeah, I guess in the age of Viagra, we can just get crazier and crazier. The boomers will never end. Yeah, I mean, how old How old are these people now? Like how old are like the youngest I guess my parents are technically like on the cusp. My dad's 59. Yeah, they might yeah, be I don't know. slightly young to be boomers, but kind of. Okay, so Mark tells his parents he wants to be left alone. And also we find out one of the big fans is Samantha Mathis, who plays Nora De Niro. And the next day we're back at school and she's on the case of trying to find out who that goes to their school is Harry, happy Harry hard on. And we go to their English class and we meet the cool English teacher... Miss Emerson, she's probably, to, other than Samantha Mathis, the second, she's the third most recognizable person among the what principal else cast. What is me. Samantha Mathis in? And is she like a blonde later in life? That sounds familiar to she's me. She's been in a, like, a lot of else? things. She was in The Thing Called Love with River Phoenix and Dermot Mulroney and Sam, Sandra Bullock. That was probably kind of her big critical success movie. And she was, she's the main girl in the Super Mario Brothers movie. I don't think I wow. don't think either of those are the one that I'm thinking of. And she's the main lady in the movie Broken Arrow once again with Christian Slater, which we could watch with Christian Slater and John Travolta. Okay, that I love anything with John Travolta because he's everything that he's in is like so weird and horrible in a good way. That might be our next movie. We'll see, but she she's in that, and I'll I, I'll be honest, I can't think of too many other things that I've seen her in, off, or, I, or I can't think of really anything uh, off the top of my. I know she has other big things. She's kind of like Bridget Fonda. They, they mesh together in my head, but Bridget Fonda, I think, maybe quit acting. Like I don't think she does anything. I don't even remember Bridget Fonda. Like is Bridget Fonda in Singles? Yes. 
what else either. The girl that got pu pulled off the bus for being pregnant, I believe, Cheryl, Cheryl Biggs, is played by a woman named Holly Sampson, who is the most working, I think, of all the people in this film. And I could only find clips of her work on pornographic websites. She, I guess, had a very extensive career after this in softcore pornography, kind of. And she looked, she looked like she was a good actor. Jan Emerson was the teacher played by Ellen Green. Did you recognize the, te the, the cool English teacher lady, Miss Emerson? No. She's Natalie Portman's mom that gets killed in The Professional. Okay, I actually just rewatched The Professional the other day, but I miss where the parents were killed. Have you seen the American and the foreign version, the French version? Um, so, no, I've only seen the one with Natalie Portman. Well, they're both the same. There's just, one's oh, just, one's one's just longer. Or... Yeah, one's just 20 minutes longer or something. Oh, okay. I don't know. Okay, so growing up, they put out a version at the movie theaters and then on videotape in America and then even on DVD. But then I think it largely got supplanted by they finally put out the original French version on DVD called Leon Le, Prof Le Professional. And as you know, as time goes by, more true fans of the movie, you know, these they're more likely to find it than some random person. So they'll go for this Le, Leon Le, Le Professional. And as a snobby movie guy, I always assumed, boy, I'm going to enjoy this Lay On Le Professionnel with the real version way more than I like this American cut down version. But it turns out almost everything they cut is weird uh, uh, sexual innuendo between Natalie Portman and, and Jean Reno. And I was like, I'll, I think I'll just keep the American version. I never want to see this well, French yeah, version again. It's real. filthy freaking director like the guy who did the fifth element and stuff like really married like a 14 year old Whoa. and wrote the movie about the experience of like falling in love with someone who was like 12 whoa the thing in the american version there's a little bit of her doing things like saying they're lovers at the, the hotel and stuff to the to the concierge or the, the check-in guy whatever something else but he always just like in the french version he's very resistant of it and it just kind of dissipates it goes away it's very little in the film but in the french version in the long version him constantly resisting her advances till finally maybe he gives in or something it's like the whole movie is him kind of being like no i don't want you like it's you know that you know the fifth element like he also directed the fifth mm -hmm. element and you know that like blue woman who's like singing in the fifth element yes she's like the opera singer so like that guy married her when she was like 14 or something. Oh, wow. When she was like 12. Wow. What point did she turn blue? Couldn't say. The, Couldn't say. This lady, Ellen Green, to me is her big thing is she's the main lady from the movie Little Shop of Horror with Rick Moranis. Okay. She's the main woman. And I see her in things over the years and I'm always like, oh, it's the Little Shop of Horrors later. I actually didn't remember that she was in The Professional until I was looking at stuff she was in. Okay, so she's, and she likes uh, Mark's writing and holds him after class to tell him for just a moment, she just like briefly holds him after class to tell him she likes his writing. Oh, she recommends he sign up for the school paper. Kids get in trouble for playing some some dirty rap. I didn't look up what group that was, actually. That's one of the soundtracks. Yeah, I didn't I know the up. rap song. Yeah. I, every old dirty rap I just assume is two live crew, but I have no idea. What. Yeah, I don't know either. And then the teachers get played a Happy Harry Hard On broadcast in the teacher's lounge. And Emerson thinks it's hilarious. She laughs at him, his masturbation jokes. What do you think about this Emerson lady? <laughs> I don't know. Like, all I kept thinking watching this was just, I don't know. Like, I guess I would probably laugh if I heard that too, but like not in a way where like I genuinely found it hilarious or something. Just That's how like, she, so it seems like she thinks it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, she really thinks it's, like, so funny. If that's, like, something sort of weird about this, too, where I'm, like, girls wouldn't listen to this. Okay, so, see, that's, it's, it's totally something only boy. I wouldn't, didn't even think of that because I'm a boy. Yeah, girls would never listen to this. Girls would not listen to this radio show and be like, oh, my God, I'm so in love. He's a rebel. Like, it's, like, really just dumb teenage boy humor that, like, I don't think, like, any girl of any age would be interested Interesting. In. Because I could totally see, like, when you were talking about how it was seemed like it was written by a teenager, I thought that, too. And I was like, these jokes that he has and things are all on the level of something a 15 or 16-year-old boy or something would think of and that a 15 or 14 or 13 year old boy would find hilarious and maybe make a tape of and pass along so i didn't find the story of him 
being popular at school that crazy. But I guess with girls, yeah, I didn't even think of that. My perspective was, yeah, I could totally see this all working, except for when the teacher laughs like it's really, no one over <laughs> 17 really would find this hilarious unless they're pretty dumb. Yeah, like you wouldn't, like you would find it funny in the sense that it's so stupid. And but that you're like, having like, to you listen to it at work. Like, you'd be yeah, laughing at the situation too. Really funny. Yeah, true. Let's see. Mathis works in the school library. It seems to be right after school or dear, maybe even during school. What is there? A, did you ever have a school where you would have a, like an hour where you might just work in the school library? No, that's like more of a college yeah. thing. Like, I don't, I mean, like we did have, okay. So when I was in high school, we had a business class mm. and like part of our business class, we had this like weird, I don't even know how to explain it. It was almost like a convenience store <laughs> where you could like go and get like sodas and like fountain Cokes the student and store and food and stuff. So part of our business class was like working in that store. So that's the only thing I can think of that's kind of similar. So for that class, we would work in the store sometimes. <laughs> But yeah, not like working in the library. Well, my mom was a guidance counselor at a middle school when I was growing up. She was, I think, in charge of the school student store. But for a year, like a school year, we had maybe even a whole year, actually, we had a Korean junior high boy live with us for a year that's, whose parents moved back to Korea but wanted him to finish out the school there. So he just lived with us. And it turned out his parents were giving him like dough we didn't know about. And he was buying like sodas and stuff and running his own student store out of his locker at the school and making extra dough with all the stuff that wasn't allowed at the real student store. And I always thought that was pretty cool. Wow, that's really cool. Our student store was legit. Like you could buy like good things. Yeah, see, I think that like even in high school, I don't know about our junior high student store, but maybe even then, I feel like we were allowed a lot of things and even we had soda machines and stuff all of a sudden maybe a coca-cola funded money into the schools but we went from like no stu no sodas available for buying at school at all to like oh yeah you can get a soda and take it in class <laughs> so he checks out or he's turning in the lenny bruce book because we see she checks it out immediately would your school have had a lenny bruce book in the school library no and like Okay, I obviously know who Lenny Bruce is and stuff. And I feel like in high school, I did not know who Lenny Bruce was, probably. And I think most people in high school would not know who Lenny Bruce was, let alone be reading a book about him. But I don't know. 1989 was different because when I was would have been Mark Hunter's age in the late 90s, I would have known who I did know who Lenny Bruce was. So it's very possible that if that book was at my school library, maybe I would have I don't know if I would have checked out books from the school library. I would have gone to the public library. I, yeah, it's it's hard for me to imagine. I don't know. I never. But that is like, the kind of book I would have checked out at the library. Yeah. Like I would, yeah, I would I, check out like Woody Allen joke books and stuff. Yeah, I would not have. I would not have been checking that out in high school. I don't even know what kind of books are in a high school library. I remember we had 2001 A Space Odyssey, but I never, that was like, I was in a, a human bondage. It seemed very much like books you might have in a high school library. But I didn't go in there much and look around or I don't know if I ever checked a book out of it or anything. I only remember, I don't know, using books from that library for research for papers or something. But like even then, probably more from the public library, not from. So, yeah, I have no idea. But maybe. She has a she has the school paper, which I guess prints a, a thing out of pictures of all of the new students. And his picture is in it. And she says he's cute, but crosses him off as a possibility of being happy Harry hard on which is crazy because obviously Christian Slater has a voice that's like very recognizable but he has the see this is one of the things he has the voice he has a voice changer thing when he's on the radio yeah a little bit but it, it still sounds like him kind of does it but yeah it still totally sounds yeah I definitely don't think I would have crossed him off after that especially I mean she doesn't have she made she did she here's the thing it's like she seems pretty hip but she didn't know who about Lenny Bruce so without reading the book and knowing who that is, maybe she would like reading the book would have been a big clue that it was was him actually. And so without knowing the book, yeah. that's not that big of a clue. But if she but she probably could have figured that out pretty fast once she started reading it. Okay, so but she she takes the book home. So anyway, we go from that to another night broadcast 
where he's talking more about the boomers and stuff and he plays the young blood come together juvenile uh, smile on your brother that song and he says he uses an expression here i'd never heard he says everybody's getting butt surfed by the system and has a like, butt, <laughs> butt surfed that's pretty crazy butthole surf yeah, is coming that's... around not a term was that like was that a thing i like, don't know i mean that's what since I was, there's a band called that, that's like, what I, that's what i wondered a, a thing people said or, you're going through my know. exact thought process that led me to making a note about getting butt have served by the system i never found out and this i think you see here that he has the pet iguana do you ever have a pet um a rodent or not rodent but uh, amphibian or lizard or or reptile any of them god no god no, no i would have wanted a lizard or iguana or something when i was younger i think that adults who have reptile pets are the worst i actually like snakes but of course i would never yeah have they one scare the hell out of me i mean the weird thing is is like people are always get your kid a pet that's easy to take care of like a fish or like a snake or like a gerbil those are really hard pets to take care of in my opinion really? a dog is like super easy to take care of even more in some ways than a cat or something you don't have to like change a litter box like uh, snakes and fish are like so hard to take care fish, of like, yeah i know I've, I've had friends with the crazy aquarium yeah it's like you have it's like so hard not to kill them snakes have to have like they have to be warm because they're like cold-blooded or whatever you have to constantly keep a light on them to keep them from dying fish you have to have all these chemicals and shit like every time you change their water you have to get it exactly right or they'll die <laughs> like that is not an easy pet like i don't understand that do you like the young bloods come together song I don't remember any of this music. You don't remember that song in general? The old 60s Youngblood song? It's like in everything from Forrest Gump to sure commercials. It's oh, like... no, I know. Yeah, now I know what song you're talking about. But I don't remember hearing it in this movie. Okay, that's fair. He but plays yeah, it ironically, song, I, guess. I guess, on his show to make fun of the boomers. And he also plays that Wiener Schnitzel song by the Descendants, which you said you hadn't heard. I was going to ask you that. He plays that in this scene. Then he shows this, he, what he stole from his dad's office was a memo from the counselor to the Hubert H. Humphrey principal telling her she was pre the girl that Cheryl Biggs uh, was pregnant and lowering school morale. Happy Harry Hardon decides to play a call uh, and he calls count the counselor David Deaver or whatever the guy, something Deaver. And I really liked the way this counselor guy played the part of being so smug about his <laughs> credentials and things. How, how did you feel about him Ali Ging this guy? I didn't love it. <laughs> this is like another thing where it feels like a movie written by teens for adults. Kind of like you need to see as an adult like how hard it is for teens. Mm -hmm. You need to see as an adult like how you look to teens or something. <laughs> like I just... I don't know. His performance was so hysterical or something. Normally I would like, but I don't know. This movie isn't, ugh, I don't know. I like really bad movies and I like like really campy stuff. But this movie is not, does not have that tone. No, this guy is almost out of a campier movie or something, but I really liked him. His name is Richard Schenken as David Deaver. And it turned out he's kind of, he may still act, but he's become far more successful as a screenwriter. I think he writes like the Band of Brothers and Pacific kind of stuff. He writes big TV and maybe some films as well. But he's had a big success. He talks to this guy and calls him a snake or something and all these. He calls him a bunch of names. Oh, and he tells that the cat, he goes one up on Timothy Leary and tells the kids not to trust anyone over 20, not just 30. I, yeah, I was shocked by that. I remember being triggered by that a little bit. <laughs> did you, why did it trigger you? Because it made me feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel he was right? No, definitely not. I mean, you should, this is, this is kind of my theory about people. I feel like teenagers are the exact same as old people. What the cutoff is for being old, I can't exactly say, but teenagers think that they know everything and then like old people think they know everything That's teenagers true. think they know everything because they like are naive and everything is novel to them and stuff they think they invented everything and then old people think they know everything because they're of experience <laughs> the opposite they think they know everything because they have the life experience to know you can't tell a teenager anything you can't tell an old person anything no i don't think you should trust teenagers i think people put way too much trust in like everything young people say or old people <laughs> there's like a weird like narrow age where you should actually listen to what people say so you should not listen to the elderly or the children no okay no but 
What about this, the next caller he takes, he, or he reads a piece of fan letter about a girl being, or someone being made to watch his or her brother jerk off. Do you remember this? And then he calls this girl who's having yeah. another girl over called Miss Screwed Up. And I wanted, wanted to point out that Miss Screwed Up looks quite a bit like I did at her age. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like looking in a I mirror of the past. That. Yeah. <laughs> I can't say I don't know what you look like as a teenager. You, you do yeah. now. <laughs> and he reads the he reads the meat. Oh, and he finds out that she's a faker, and he smells that it's a rat. And then he reads a love letter that apparently one of several from an unknown woman. And this one talks about meet me, beat me, and we see as it's read out loud her poetry written in lovely handwriting and black marker. And Samantha Word Mathis is mouthing every word of the poem in her apartment as it's read, so we know it's written by her that she's this person. And the poem has the line about talk hard. In it. Did you like her poem? No. Obviously. <laughs> I hated all of her poetry so much. Uh, like, I don't know. <laughs> well, then he plays that Beastie it, Boys song. Oh, go ahead. It really. I, ju I wasn't going to say anything except just it's hard to it's hard to watch like it feels this is like how it, this is like a poem that a teen would actually write so it's hard to it's hard to watch for me then we get the Malcolm call where Ma he gets Malcolm's letter and Malcolm talking about being all alone his big thing is he's all alone and what did you think about Malcolm in this uh, this moment of the movie I think that this type of stuff is so hard to like I think like you can't if you're going to deal with like a really serious topic, I think that you can't deal with really seriously. And I feel like this movie deals with serious topics like in a way that's really, really self-serious and really maudlin and sentimental. And it just, I don't know. I think all of the teenagers in this movie are also really compassionate and stuff. <laughs> that's one thing that's not very Yeah, there like, really realistic. isn't an evil teenager in it, is there? Mm-mm. -mm. Which is crazy because that's the most evil time of your life. Yeah, there isn't a kids are so cruel kid in there, really, is there? There is, but he, we don't know who the kid is. We only hear about him later. We'll come, we'll get to that. Apparently, in earlier versions of the script, Malcolm was more explicit about his problem and it was that he was secretly gay. And I think that the studio or something didn't want him, Malcolm to be gay. But later on, we get to the gay guy, right? Yeah. But I guess that was a thing that, so the guy who played Malcolm and Alan Moyle, that was their secret, was that his secret pain was that he was not just alone, but he was gay. And so he hangs up on Harry and Harry makes a joke about being hung up on. Then he tries to call Malcolm back and Malcolm's off the hook. We see, or Malcolm's phone's off the hook. Malcolm puts his revolver gun to his chin. Harry says uh, he sits on the stairs at lunch every day alone, talking to the crowd. And Mathis makes a note about he sits on lunch stairs, stairs at lunch. Not a super good way to shoot yourself in the head, by the way. <laughs> <Or> to explain <laughs> why to not. Blow your face off, but <laughs> I have not seen... a super, super good way to kill yourself, maybe. I heard about this from a woman... Uh, she she was involved with a man. He was they they had gone through some kind of breakup, and suddenly I guess he had done this and was in the hospital for all of the wounds in his face, trying to murder himself. Yet he was still very much alive. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's not much going on. Like you want to, you know, <laughs> if you want to actually kill yourself, you're gonna want to get, you know, get like your brain stem or something like that. Like this is just. <laughs> How would you get the just, brainstem? Uh, I think, you know, kind of like through the back of the roof of your mouth. Oh. This isn't like advice or anything. No, I'm no, just we, saying, we like, you're going to just make your problems <laughs> worse. We're here for the facts. If you blow well, your face off, you so, will probably, or at least maybe, survive and just not have a face. Yeah. Chicks dig scars, though. That could help you out and not make you so down. So we go to the next day. There's another rap song on the soundtrack. And Mark sees that his school, that his shows, we see we see his shows becoming really popular. All kinds of people, like, writing things. I guess I guess his thing is, like, so be it is one of his his catchphrases in the movie. Which, did this trigger any kind of memories for you? The so, so be it uh, catchphrase? No. It reminded me of So It Goes by the Kurt Vonnegut Slaughterhouse-Five thing. Let's see. I read Slaughterhouse Five when I was so young. Mm -hmm. I don't remember very much about it at all. I read it in high school, but I just recently read a book about Kurt Vonnegut and his brother, what it was like at General Electric in the 40s and 50s. It's a pretty interesting book. It was called The Vonnegut Brothers Science and 
literature in the House of Magic or something like that. Mark, he's taking in his closet fame. He and Paige try to say what's up and he fails. We hear the song, we hear the theme song to the movie, Talk Hard, which may sounded to me like it was by the lead singer of the B-52s. Do you know the lead singer of the B-52s name? The red-haired woman? No, I think the, the guy. Like the, the song man. was like, Talk Hard! Oh, I don't know what his name is. And so she, then it's lunch and she finds him on the stairs here where no one else, of all these fans, no one else thinks to look for Happy Harry Hard on. And no one looks for him on the stairs at lunch this day after he says it on the show, except for her. He, she asks him out and he says no. He turns her down for the date. Then the teachers all meet again to discuss the Happy Harry Hard on problem. Did you recognize the principal of the school lady from anything? Mm, I don't think, I don't know. She looks vaguely familiar maybe. Same. But like... I looked her up. She, her big thing that I would mostly know her from as an adult is the movie Shortcuts. Is that she's the lady that's she's the singing lady whose daughter is Lori Singer and commits suicide, the cellist, and she has a I big part. She, she, she sings a lot. She has a big part in Shortcuts, but she's also one of the three villains in Superman Three. That's the other main thing I remember her from. She plays kind of a similarly very hard-ass lady. Then right from that, though, we go to, into class, Miss Emerson's class, and she breaks the news to everyone about the death of Malcolm, his suicide. And that's the first we learned that he was successful. And Mark is sad. I don't like suicide in movies. How about in life? It's, it's I love it in life. I don't like it. I don't like it in movies. Like, I feel like it's a really hard thing to... I don't know. It's kind of like, okay... Here's the example that I can use. Like, every time I, <laughs> I should not be saying this, but every time I see a woman getting beaten in a movie, <laughs> I cannot stop laughing. Reno, I'm so glad you said that because that's how I feel and people think I'm sick, but it's because I think that's something to do with the fact that I know it's fake. Yeah, like it's just so weird. <laughs> like, I just imagine the actors going there and doing it and having the day. It all makes me laugh. Yeah, I just, I don't know. It's like the funniest thing in the world to me. Me and my best friend um, watch the movie, like, Sleeping with the Enemy. I've like, never seen all it by the time. Like, we'll just go high and watch Sleeping with the Enemy because it's just so funny. <laughs> like, I know it's wrong, but it's so funny. It's the same kind of thing where, like, you just can't, you just can't treat these things with the appropriate reverence or, like, you just can't get the tone right or something. I can't think of any movie where I've seen suicide or abuse or something that I'm, I don't know, a fond of or something. So then we see that he, we see him go on this covert mission and check his P.O. box where he, like, pretends to look for one P.O. box and he goes to the other one so to keep his his identity on the low and where people send the fan mail for his show. And then, but, she, but Samantha Mathis, Nora De Niro has followed him and she stakes him out and, and confronts him outside and reveals that she's the meet, beat me, meet me, meet me, beat me lady. And he's, you know, expresses that. And she's like, Oh, I get it. You're sad about Malcolm. And he goes home and then he, his parents confront him. They've heard about the Malcolm suicide and they're afraid that he's next. Right? I thought this was pretty good. <laughs> Being a son of a guidance counselor, I could tell you this is exactly what would happen. Like, it's like with my, my mom, any time anything happened at a school, it was like it was going to, we, we were going to have, or if she read about it or found out about it or went to a meeting and found out about a new drug, like we would be, and I would be immediately asked about it and, and things. Like, I remember I was pretty sheltered. I had no idea about most of this stuff. And I remember she saw some like, thing of, and about raves and was like talking to me about ketamine. She's like, Ozzy, have you been in the K-hole? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what she's even talking about. <laughs> Dad suggests he talk to someone, which is, of course, ironic because he's talking to everyone every night. As you can all have a good laugh there. And the news is now doing stories on Happy Harry from the mortuary of, of Malcolm. And this, so this gets Harry to go to the air. And he starts having his feelings, says he never meant to hurt anyone. He apologizes for Malcolm's suicide, saying he wishes he would have just told him not to do it. And he talks about when you commit suicide, you shit yourself. And that's how that, he just kind of makes it comedic by saying, you don't want that to happen, guys. Don't shit, don't shit yourselves. I, okay. I, you know, I appreciate, I read a bunch of reviews of this on Rotten Tomatoes and I was so shocked by, people really love this movie. Yeah, and people, I literally read some review that was like, this is one of the most important movies ever made or something. Like something crazy. So obviously this movie did sort of strike a chord with people or touch people or something maybe like who we're having problems or something. And like, if that's the case, you know. May I suggest that's that that's what they say about every shit movie that's about some kind of disability <laughs> that I just want to shoot? Is that they're like, oh, this is an important, important movie. 
And I'm you talking about how much you hate all these parts of the movie makes me think, remember when I saw this movie when I was probably like 12 or 13, probably for the first time, I hated these parts of the movie. I wish the whole movie was just him doing the radio DJ. I really liked only that and Samantha Mathis' boobs were also good. <laughs> And everything else was like, whatever. And I liked the Leonard Cohen song. I mean, yeah, if this had just been a movie that didn't try to, like, I don't know, be about social issues or something, or like, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's no I fun. wouldn't hate it so much. But what this thing about shitting yourself made me think that in so many movies, war movies and stuff, we see when a bunch of, like, people are dead or something, or when, like, someone's trying to chase over someone, that somebody pretends to be dead, and it's like the people pass over them and believe they're a corpse. The people, they should always check to see if the person has shit themselves. <laughs> him or herself right that's the way to know yeah i don't know how true that is i know someone who her mom actually did body removals mm. as a job wow and um wow yeah i don't know how true it is that everybody shits themselves when they die but you know it's a good excuse I'm sure to happens. look though i don't know if i if that would be a deterrent he gets everybody all riled up and Paige she blows up her microwave with all of her awards in it while he plays kick out the jams by the mc5 who yeah. are communists oh, I, that was that was a song i recognized i forgot about a kick out the jams and i don't remember I don't remember which one it was where he talked about this, but it's where people just use music that is, I don't know, like what they're trying to do in their mind. And like, I use like Tyler Perry as an example, <laughs> playing Sam Cooke or something. Like it just, whatever they think, like the emotional resonance of the scene is, it just doesn't, I don't know. This was an example of that where this is, you just overshot this. <laughs> like playing the song is overshooting what you're going for. And then he has the call from the, the gay kid that tells him about like how he meets the guy and then gets hate crime. That's pretty, pretty uh, sensitive and earnest. And you get all the people reacting all the like adults and kids reacting and the news debating its actual newsworthiness and people bring up the FCC for the first time. There's also the, where we get like the different cops and you see that some of the people, the adults, man, I remember this is how being a kid feels and stuff, you know? So it's like, not all the parents are enraged. Some people are, this is great or this is okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure people would, especially now. I feel like everyone is obsessed with having teens think that they're cool. <laughs> I mean, now no one ever hears his show. Every kid in the world has the Instagram and the YouTube. He'd really have to be doing something special for the for kids to give a fuck. Yeah, like every single person in your school is basically this person. <laughs> yes. No. Okay, so we find that somebody gets brought up, we get the FCC gets brought up for the first time, which comes into play later. Then we go the next day, we get the Mark walking around and we get to hear uh, Pixies, the, that, um, what is it, Wave of Mutilation? Or it's something? Wave of Mutilation, yeah. yeah. Do you like that song? Yeah, I mean, I I really loved the Pixies when school and stuff, so I always am going to have a little bit of like a nostalgia for them, I think. I didn't know this song. I've never been a big Pixies guy, but I didn't mind this song. I, I listened to a lot of the music after the movie. We watched the movie. I, I tracked down a lot of these songs and it wasn't bad. It sounds good in the movie. Then, then we have the uh, Deaver has his bionic program, which is some kind of, believe it or, believe it or not, I care, bionic. And they're investigating. They bust the bootleg tape guy who is buddies with a young Seth Green we see there in a cameo, in a small, small role, Seth Green. I do not remember seeing Seth Green. Seth Green and the bootleg kid. It was another, like, yeah, these two characters. When I, Seth Green and the bootleg kid are probably, and, and ha ha Happy Harry, Mark, are the three characters who, in the movie are probably the most like my friends and I what we would have been like and they make this like song they they they're the ones that rig up from the intercom this hip-hop uh dub song of the things the principal says or mr whatever the guy and it's mocking him and everybody's like get turn this off blah 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 <laughs> when i was in high school there was a legend that kids had actually done this to our principal because he had been the principal there a long time and that in years previous some kids have put together this thing of things he always said like he always said teachers students and sometimes he would say the eagle has landed he had catchphrases and somebody had allegedly made this kind of thing and i always now wonder if it wasn't just an urban legend that so they had done this or somebody had actually done this we believed they had done it when i was in high school that's for sure i literally don't even remember of my high school was. I maybe only remember because of that legend. Yeah, I don't think there were, I mean, not 
not that I remember, but I was just, I hardly ever even went to school when I was in high school. I was not, I was not a fan. I barely got through it. Like I would constantly, I would miss like a few days of school a week, probably in high school. Yeah. The news is now at school. What's his name? Billy Morissette is outside with smoke bombs talking to the news, I think at this point. And he gets pulled into the office and Mark learns about Paige blowing shit up. The, they call this emergency PTA meeting where they're going to have the youngest school commissioner in Arizona history at it, Mark's father. And they also track down the, the cops, go to the P.O. box and try to bust Mark's P.O. box and find out that it's rented to Chuck U. Farley. And, um, hold oh, on. Will you hold on one second? Because yes. I'm going to fill fill my drink really quick and Do I'll be it. right back. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we find out they're going to, about Chuck U. Farley. Happy Harry hard on when they find out who he is, will be charged with criminal solicitation in Malcolm's suicide death. And the dad says he doesn't get this happy Harry guy. He's a student at Hubert H. Humphrey. You don't rock the boat if you're sitting in it, which is very non-hippie non-change the world talk and the mom probably not too pleased with that they have the pta meeting where all these parents speak out i mean it's just this was very like um it reminded me of the saved by the bell episode where like jesse is like i'm so excited mm -hmm. like on caffeine pills like the the popular girl like comes out and like yes. she's all like bandaged up and she just i'm just going goes through the motions of being perfect yeah like why is this school so stressed like it does the school doesn't seem, you know, like this isn't like Harvard Westlake school. Like this isn't some like place where everyone is expected to like get into like an Ivy League university. Like by all accounts, it's just like a normal high school. Like why is everyone so stressed out? We'll get into <laughs> and, this like, a little later, that? but the thing about like school fundings and stuff is so crazy. And there's always some kind of like numbers, kids failing something kind of scam going on, like a threshold of getting certain monies like sometimes you want to make it look like you're doing worse than you are to get money or something like that it's like there it seems like this kind of we get into this i guess we'll talk about this like turns out they've been cherry picking kids based on low sat scores from beginning of the year to figure out ways to bust them and get them out of school to make it look like their school's really awesome and it's like apparently the director heard about this happening somewhere in canada from his sister or someone who works in schools or something like this this happened somewhere some something akin to this and i remember like when in california like the no child left behind or maybe ever i don't know laws and things and a lot of it was like uh, what do you do with kids that don't speak english well because you get a certain amount of money for esl if they end up hurting your test scores because they don't speak english you know it's all these different things for money it's like so they're kind of like their weird scam thing even though you, you you're right it doesn't like it seem like this is the kind of school where they'd be like obsessed with trying to get all the sat scores really high it was an interesting weird play the system scheme by schools that you don't see a lot of that in the movies weird uh bureaucracy finagling malfeasance yeah, it's just like almost the adults at the school just seem like insane bull. Yes, especially Miss Emerson. So they, oh, one thing I liked is one of the team that uh, at the PTA meeting, a guy says, he's like, I work with gangs in the, teenage gangs in the city. I say we go after this guy. <laughs> it's like, what does he mean? Are they going to go murder him? Why does that, is that one part of his work with the gangs? I don't know. I got no idea what he even meant. Okay. So the kids are all riled up. They want this next bro broadcast. Nora goes to Mark's house and he's barbecuing his fan mail. They have a moment and he decides to broadcast after all. And there, there are two or three parts where he doesn't feel like broadcasting anymore. And then with almost no no nudging, he goes on the air again and kind of repeats. That's why I made all these notes because I felt like so many of the scenes and sequences were so similar. And they just kind of build yeah. that it would be very easy to get this movie out of order. Yeah, absolutely. And so he, he, but he starts talking about how we can't talk to girls, how he has this problem talking to girls. And he uses the expression, he's like, when every time I try to open my mouth, the fit hits the shan. And it's like, I remember <laughs> hearing that expression, the fit hits the shan in the movie Wag the Dog. And I didn't remember it at the time in Pump Up the Volume. And I thought it was really funny. Have you ever heard anybody say that in real life? I don't think, no. Me neither. No. It's kind of funny, though. His parents want to come in. They hear him talking in there, finally. I mean, 
How hard is it, like, the fact that just them yeah, not paying he any attention to him. Show. Yeah, and him being an only child and stuff, not, and having all this equipment and stuff and all this know-how that ne- never occurring to them is pretty crazy. It, like, it's part of the movie's point that they're so out of touch with what's really going on with Mark that they don't, they think he's happy Harry Hard on and he starts trying to say he's talking to himself, reading out loud, they don't believe it. And suddenly Nora pops up and says that, oh, he's got a woman in his room and he's been talking to me. They're, they're cool with it. They thought they'd relieve. They thought he was that happy, Harry hard on character. Yeah, and it's like, okay, I would be like more concerned if like my child had like a girl just like randomly like secretly in their room or something. Very like, that would be like more of a concern. Interesting point. See, I took this as like I thought. See, it's funny you say that because you come from a town like this, more or less in a school. You you identify with. To me, I would have been in. I was not allowed to have a a girl in my room with the door shut, much less a girl snuck in my room that my parents were not aware was in the house with the door shut and locked. It's like, I would, it's like, I would have been in a trillion times less trouble for being happy Harry Harden (laughs) than I would have been for having Nora De Niro in my room. And and that surprises me that you, yeah, I thought you came from a much more free sex for the kids. Well, okay. So like, I don't think that my parents like personally, like so much would have, I mean, even my parents like they would prop they would let me have like whoever over they didn't care or whatever Mm -hmm. i think if my parents knew that like i had someone over like they wouldn't care if i was in a room with the door shut or something if i if my parents came into my room and there was like some random guy in my room or something that was like hiding and looked kind of (laughs) disheveled or something i think they would have a problem (laughs) Even my parents who were not like super strict about that kind of stuff. Yeah, wow. So, but they're psyched. The dad is all about it. And it looks like it's gotten them pretty horny. Like seeing yeah. that Mark is scoring is getting his parents want to want to have sex now. So Paige says she's leaving. And he's like, and the parents try to get her to stay. But she's like, no, no, I'll see you at school tomorrow. And she leaves. And Mark broadcasts again. He's really like on cloud nine now. And he rips off as she goes topless for this. How did you like this? You talked about. How, uh, how you'd probably enjoy this part. This was the weirdest scene to me. Like, this girl is, like, absolutely... She's, like, hysterical. She's, like, obsessed with him. And, like, yeah, she's basically sexually assaulted, <laughs> to be honest. He's kind of trying to, like, push her off of him and get her off of him. And she's just more and more, like, increasingly aggressive and stuff. I liked what he talks about. He talks about how he's naked except for wearing a cock ring. And it cuts to Miss Emerson having wine alone at dinner. And she just laughs for a thousand years at this. It's like she really wants to fuck Happy Harry Hard on bad. And Mark Hunter. And you know what else I think? I think Mark Hunter's mom wants to have sex with him as well. He identi- He now has all of the attributes that she respected in her husband when she fell in love with him. And he ha- hearing about Happy Harry Hard on then having her son around gets her hard for her husband. So it's like... Like who? Okay, I just once again. He's got all the ladies. Woman, what woman would be attracted? It's like I, I just can't. I can't understand it at all. Like even as a teenager, I don't know. Like this is like the last sort of thing that would be cool to like a teenage girl. Left it makes sense to what you're life. saying. Yeah, it's like really, it's, he's an AV nerd. Yeah, it's not who just pretends like his radio show consists of him saying like really like stupid stream of consciousness teenage thoughts and like pretending to jerk off or something. <laughs> And also, you know, thinking of other things in this line of what Pump of the Volume also would come out of, in the 70s, there was that CB radio fad, and there were things like the the Convoy, the Rubber Duckies, and stuff like that. Then there was also, like, you had um, Good Morning Vietnam, and then people's obsession with prank calls. Prank calls were a big deal in those days and yeah all that's kind of gone by the wayside as technology has changed yeah does anyone still do prank calls i don't know like who picks up their phone for a no caller id unless they're expecting a call from a job or something that would be the best way to prank somebody now i guess is no caller id someone who's looking for a job (laughs) he calls deaver uh, david deaver the counselor again and deaver's smug and they've been tracing the call and his neighbor, uh, Mark's neighbors get busted. He dedicate Mark dedicates a funky uh, makeout jam called "Why Can't I Fall in Love" to Nora, the too, but he doesn't name her. And then he goes outside, and she's still there. 
She never actually left in all this time. She's just been hanging out outside his house. And then she gets topless to meet, to uh, match him. And then they circle each other for a long period of time, looking in each other's eyes. How did you like this? There's yeah. literally nothing about this. <laughs> like. I loved it as a teenager for obvious reasons, but then the two obvious reasons. But then I also, I, this, I, what I liked about it is they circle each other, but in the modern films where people are always trying to show off how easily they can move a camera, the camera would just swoop around them 50 times and it'd be annoying. It would be really distracting. And that's what they would do. And then, so then we go back and it's the next day at school. And then we have Paige and he encounter each other again, or not Paige, but rather Nora and Mark encounter each other again, and they don't know, Mark can't talk again, and they have like the longest montage of them looking at each other and smiling and laughing and not saying anything in Dissolves with Rick Cliff Martinez's score that ends with them kissing. Like Nora seems obsessed with him and he seems like he hates her <laughs> like, most of the time. He seems like he could not be like less interested in her and like he's like afraid of her, which is understandable. <laughs> like I would be afraid of her. This is really funny because looking at this, I thought this part was really good actually. Just this part of them not, because he's always talking about he doesn't know what to say. And they just have this long scene where he doesn't know what to say and she doesn't make him say anything and then they kiss and it's just done from with these really uh, telephoto Lindsay shots of their faces and the score. And I was like, this is actually kind of a weird thing that makes sense. Maybe a realistic moment for two young lovers or maybe two any lovers. And maybe uh, I thought that was kind of well directed and score. That was the moment where Cliff Martinez, I noticed his score was like, this is kind of good. And I think it sort of makes sense. I think his behavior kind of makes sense, but like her behavior like does not make sense well, at you, all. The way you've cast this movie in a whole different light where she makes so much less sense to me than she ever did. Mark wants to quit once again because it's, he's gotten too popular and it's gotten too out of control. So he wants to quit again. And Nora urges him to keep going. And Samantha Mathis now gets expelled because she was failing math and playing hooky and then she talks shit. And Mark says, school sucks. And then Miss Emma Emerson says she quit her job. And so she's saying goodbye. And then Mark's dad gets into it with the principal. And I I guess we have we're set up for a new night where Mark is soldering in his apartment and or in his back room and doing all these different technical things. We see the FCC guy show up. He is another one of the few recognizable actors in this movie. Al Arthur Watts, played by James Hampton. Did you recognize this guy? Uh -uh. Well, he is Michael J. Fox's dad in Teen Wolf, and he was okay. so he he has he's a he's a Teen Wolf legend, and he's also in such films as the original of The Longest Yard. But he's kind of an about face here in Teen Wolf. He's a cool dad who understands what it was like to be a teen, and the and and is down with the teens. But in this one, he's the ultimate stuff shirt dick as Mr. Watt. So real real come down there. In my mind, I have like a professor who like edited the movie Teen Wolf. Yes, something. you did. You did. That's right. The editor of the movie Teen Wolf was one of your professors in college. And Teen Wolf famously has a mistake by the editor where in the very last shot of the film freezes with a guy pulling an extra pulling his penis out of his jeans in the background. Have you ever heard this legend? She, no, but she was one of the only teachers at that school that I actually liked. And Everybody, like, I never had her. Everybody like seemed to like her. Sweet. Her name was Fox, was... actually, like Michael J. Fox, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah her last name is Fox, but yeah, she was she was a really nice lady. <laughs> that's uh, that's what I hear, and I think that she's on like a VH1 or something talking about that last shot in Teen Wolf, one of those like oh, I wow. love the '80s or something, and she seemed nice on the program. Mark has been doing all this thing to rig up a mobile pirate radio broadcasting station, which I don't I don't understand the end of this movie. I watched it like. I had to watch it. Okay, I fell asleep the first time I was watching it. And I rewatched. I just rewatched the whole movie today because I was only going to rewatch the ending, but I was like, you know what? It's not a very Let long movie. Let me just watch the whole movie again. I don't, yeah, I don't really understand the ending of this movie. I don't understand why he does this. Why does he rig up his mom's Jeep and stuff to be. So that the signal will constantly change where it's coming from, so it'll be harder to trace. So people can't find him? Yeah. But isn't the purpose, isn't the song that he plays at the beginning of going to jail, isn't his 
doesn't he go into it like knowing that like I don't really get it well I think that you know maybe the song is just an F you saying you he they're going to send him to jail if he played if he broadcast so he's playing a song just being like yeah I'm doing it anyway I'm going to jail had you ever heard this the song is called hello dad I'm in jail and it's by Was Not Was, who do the Everybody I, Walk the Dinosaur song, song among I, other. I have not heard of the song. I became obsessed a little bit with this song after we watched this movie. I loved just the way I was like, what is this song? I do like the song. Yeah, yeah the I song looked it up. Fun. And I to all, anyone who listens to this, look up the look, the Hello Dad, I'm in Jail song. I love the song and the video for it I loved as well. I'll have to watch the video. But I like the song too. But yeah, like it seems like this going into this like knowing that that's how i read it mm-hmm. that he like knows he's that he's to gonna busted. go to jail he does end up doesn't he go to the place where where they're all at yeah yeah that's so i point. don't really get it he just turns himself in more or less just give me he goes to nora's house and he asks her for his for her help saying that he needs her to drive the car while he broadcasts and she says it's about time. And he's rigged up his mom's Jeep. Because we've always seen he doesn't drive in the other scenes, right? But I guess what happened here, the true story of this is that in the script, he drives himself. What happened is he had a DUI and was not legal to drive. And so in real life. And so they had to have someone else drive the car in the scenes. So they rewrote it. And otherwise, does it make any sense for her to be with him unless she's driving the car? Yeah, no, that doesn't make sense either why she was even there it seems like he doesn't even really need her to drive the car he's needs to flip a switch drive he's just talk putting like her in kind of peril by like being associated but in the in her not just being a passive character who loves the boy she does have value here and that she's like yeah go for it and i'll i'll drive it's about time you asked me for help motherfucker i don't know i don't know like i don't really see it that way. okay <laughs> i see it there's no reason for her to do this and putting her at risk also mm-hmm. Very true. <laughs> by being associated with him when he's doing something illegal and going to jail. Well, they also cut to this other song here um, in some part of this. Oh, we also, in this part, we get the the Nora, uh, the Concrete Blonde cover of Everybody Knows. And we also get uh, the song by called Living in a Fast Lane by Urban Dance Squad, which I guess is a Henry Rollins band. And boy, I hated this Living in a Fast Lane song. It sounds like, like a Rage Against the Machine dance song song or something to me and uh, not my kind of song. I don't even I don't even remember um, I think you don't the song's not massively featured in the movie but I actually hate all music by Henry Rollins I no, hate I've hated Black everything Black. I've ever heard by him I don't know like anything <laughs> I've heard he's not for me that I know of no. Maybe somebody could play something for me that I like actually Black Flag's music I hate Black Flag because it's all about like empowerment and it's very similar to this movie <laughs> like, mm. the tone of Black Flag's music is very similar to the tone of Pump Up the Volume that is not a shocker and I would imagine in the heyday of Black Flag is probably when this was conceived the Pump Up the Volume was probably conceived by this guy and yeah the Urban Dance Squad and Henry Rollins just yeah it really feels right in the mental lane of this movie that's a good call basically this is a movie made by Henry Rollins. <laughs> His voice disguiser breaks and he goes and, he, and he's going to talk with his real voice, and which, of course, Samantha Mathis loves. And he then he tells everyone to take to the air themselves and talk loud and curse. Say, say shit and fuck a million times if you want to or something like that. And, the, and then uh, he gets busted. And that's the end of the movie. And oh, at the end of the movie, you hear all these different people's broadcasts. You hear these little pieces of different students being like, I'm Paige with, with happy Paige hard on. Yeah, like I'm everyone's doing own little pirate radio things in different states and stuff like everyone was um inspired yes but he goes to he gets busted in the end so is it a happy ending or is what do you, what did you think about the ending of the picture um i i don't i think that my opinion of it is skewed because i read a bunch of reviews and they were all like it doesn't have a happy ending like it ends badly but i didn't necessarily read it that way i mean it's you know, I didn't necessarily read it as that, like, how much trouble is he really going to get? That's what, that was my next question is, what do you think happens to Harry Hart, to, to Mark Hunter 
after this movie. Maybe he not like nothing. Maybe he'll Agreed. get kicked out of something. Like I he's think not. This looks he's great not, on a college application. Oh, I think yeah. I think in school colleges would think it was so cool. Like it would only help him because he's got the parents that'll help. There, it's not like he's going to not have a lawyer. And it's yeah, it's like he's going to have every advantage of the system, and he's going to get off easy. Really, he's not going to get anything. Yeah, nothing's going to happen. And he helped expose corruption. Let's, that's it a, just like raised his profile and mm-hmm. made him like a micro celebrity or something. And yeah, I'm sure colleges would love the story. It is a happy ending, it, but it, it's not a... Uh... I liked the ending of the movie because it's abrupt and because the ending, the movie third act, like here, it just does go into just like some kind of crazy Fantasia world with the, the, with the mobile pirate radio station that somehow people can get and works, can constantly works. It's just ridiculous. And it's almost like the movie just explodes. It's like, oh, we're just done. It's over, bro. This movie reminds me a little bit of the movie Airheads, actually. Oh yeah, which I have not seen since I was much, much younger and I enjoyed as well. But I like Airheads. Because it's not a movie about like teen problems and suicide. It's just a stupid Taking fun the air. movie. If uh, this movie had been like a stupid fun movie, I would have liked it, I think. And I would like it more if it was more just him being a DJ saying stupid fun things and less yeah. teen problems. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the film. And spoilers. Before we rate it, do you have any thoughts on the movie that we didn't get to? I don't think so. so how did you like Mark Hunter's clothes? I, God, I don't know. It's weird. I had kind of like a nostalgia, I think in my 20s, this sort of fashion. And I think now there was a time in my 20s and stuff where I wore a bunch of flannel shirts and stuff like that, like grunge era sort mm. of fashion. And like now I don't love it. Like when I see it, I don't love it one thing he wears in the movie is a is a work shirt that he would have gotten like at a thrift store that says dick on it yeah and that would have been yeah. like when i was in high school well, close to 10 years late well i graduated high school 10 years after this movie came out that would have been the coolest so those work <laughs> shirts were like the coup but not so much now oh the times where he pretends to jack off on the air and it cuts to all the kids being like oh man oh it's like do they really it's like these kids are way too gullible they, they, they can't possibly think he's really masturbating in those moments it's just like yeah and like girls once again girls teen girls listening to that and being like this is crazy like he's so hot and stuff no one no one would feel that way like no one like i can see like teen boys feeling that way yes like, well, no th- girl that was my that next way. thing was that i ran for student council when i was 16 and much like the mark hunter happy harry hard on humor i remember i passed out peanuts and little bouncy balls as like my giveaways and i would say to play with my balls and put my nuts in your mouth and they that <laughs> The teen boys did quite enjoy those slogans. And let's see. Did you win or did you I got kicked out of the election. For doing that? No, no, no. Uh, For, there there became a problem with some people defaced another candidate's posters. And I believe that because I was doing so many other crazy things, like the other thing that I was suspected of having done this, but I believe in fact, it was probably that boy's own friends trolling him doing it. What happened is I turned in a speech and the speech, it went from you ha- you could just put up anything you want to you had not have anything up and everything had to be approved. And I had this speech that didn't get approved and I had to turn in a different speech. And when I came to bring it in, they just said, no, it was too late. I was kicked out. And I really think the answer was they thought I had done the first thing and they were looking for any reason to kick me out at that point. But I was innocent. I was just having a laugh. And yeah, so no, I wasn't even in the election. Yeah, I was going to ask you what dirty stuff you were into with all the kids who like being obsessed with things with bad lyrics and bad language. Like I certainly went through a phase where things that were dirty or naughty, like certainly like would perk up yours because they weren't allowed. They were tabooed. It did you have anything like this that you um, were into? I really loved, I really loved Brett Easton Ellis when I was in high oh, school. Oh, that would so. be a perfect thing like this, right? Yeah, that was definitely one for Perfect sure. answer. Did you have any kids that were suicidal and brought up that they were suicidal to you when you were in school? Um, I was probably like, <laughs> I was that kid in school. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I don't know. I actually had a great, I actually had a great time in high school and everything felt very like light and fun. And I don't remember, um, anything like this now. High school is a blast. Like, I know you're not supposed to say that and like, it's lame to like be an adult, but like, I like loved being a teenager. Well, I, the, the thing where he says he never told Malcolm not to kill himself made me think about when I was in 10th grade, I have a friend. Or had a friend uh, that he would in class 
write in his papers and things about how he was contemplating suicide and was really depressed, two of my other friends and I would tease him about them in class in front of everybody and ask him just things like if he would kill himself, if he would call us so we could come over and watch, and things like that. Yeah, this is exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that is how like teenagers yes. behave. And he was a cool enough guy that he rolled with it. Oh, he he mentions wanting to be cum, sent cum soaked letters. Would you like if people send us fan letters for them to be cum soaked? Absolutely not. No. In your PO box. I'm a prude. Like absolutely not. Miss Emerson tells uh you know she always seems like she has a crush on Mark Hunter and she's like, Seems like you're having trouble concentrating lately. And so I was thinking, how would pornography Suggest that he she help him uh, with his concentration. So kids are the kids are really cool with the the parents are all cool with their kids smoking in this movie, right? Like it's like Mark sm- smokes and his parents are okay with it. I don't really remember. Like, does he smoke in front of his parents? I'm pretty sure there's a part, yeah, where they they when, I think maybe even when they come back there at some point, maybe with the Nora thing or something, it's like he like lights a smoke at some point. I forget. There's there like was some, a lot of smoking by teens. In this yes, movie, like. and v- nothing else. Really, like, there's a part where he even says like we're in the height of the AIDS thing, right? AIDS and say no to drugs and stuff scares in 1989. There's nudity with Samantha Mathis, but there's no like marijuana or booze. No, or like no hard drugs. drugs. And he brings Not it up. He's like, well, there's no drugs, there's no sex, or something like that at some point in the movie. Oh, all signs would point to him being the DJ. Come on. He was yeah, a- I mean, his voice alone. And like, just his whole thing. As a kid, this is kind of a fantastical dramedy. But as an adult, it's a fairy tale melodrama. There's a song in the end credits... The the song, maybe the Talk Hard songs has something, a lyric that says something about being a midget standing tall. <laughs> and then just another note on the animation, um, the the cartoon, the, the, or not animation, the Hello Dad, I'm in Jail video is animation by an, an animator named Christoph Simon. I think we would see this like on liquid television on MTV back in the day with like Bill Plimpton cartoons and the Mike Judge office space. And that's pretty much all I have for Pump Up the Volume, I think. So what on a scale of one to ten, how did you like the movie? I would give the movie like a two. Wow. I'm going to go with a seven. So that's a nine out of 20. How would you give Christian Slater's performance? Uh, you know, I'm going to give him high marks for this because it's he he did the best with, with what he was given here. I'm going to give his performance um, a nine. Wow, that's pretty good. I'm going to give it a ten. I don't know what really would have improved at all. Let's see. So that's uh that's pretty good. That's a 19 out of 20. So we're at 28 out of 40. And then on how hunky was Christian Slater in this movie? Unfortunately, like as I said, um, radio guy, so it's just like already like, oh wow de facto unattractive to me. And I think after watching this movie, like I I don't think I find Christian Slater attractive. Nice. <laughs> and it will be interesting to see if like there's any movie where I find him attractive, but I found him especially not attractive in this movie. Like he reminded me of a real teenage boy in this movie, like <laughs> which again means like he did a good job in this performance, but sexually repulsive on many levels. Mm. So I'm going to say a one for me. I'm going to rate the hunkiness pretty high. Uh... I don't know. I guess it's a good question. I give the hunkiness an eight. And so, what did you? What did you give it? What did your? What? How many out of ten? A one. A one. Wow. So we're at nine. Uh, so that's another nine on to twenty-eight. So we're at uh, now thirty-seven out of sixty. And so, <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, how much more did you want to see Christian Slater in the movie? Um, I'm gonna go with a five because I think he was just in it like the right amount. Okay, but well, wouldn't that be like a ten? Well, no, because it's how much more do I want to see him? Uh, like, if I wanted to see more of him at 10, I didn't okay. want to see more or less. Okay, that's a good call. That's a good call. Well, that's a zero. Well, wouldn't, like, a zero be, like... Because we subtract from the score based on how much we wanted to see him more. These okay, are all negative like, points. Okay, but, like, I didn't want to see him less. I just didn't want to see him oh, more. Oh, good point. That's a good call. You know? Okay, so we'll give that a five. You're right. Okay, okay. That's a good point. You, you've, you've taken me out of the darkness here. <laughs> I will give it a seven because, like I said, I wish there were less of the other characters and more just of uh, happy Harry Hart on talking. So that'll be a 12. And that's another F. <laughs> Have you uh, have you seen anything good lately? I have watched a couple of movies since the last time we talked. I watched Arthur yesterday. Which one is it? Isn't that one that's been remade at some point? Probably, but this was the original one, I think, with Liza Minnelli and what's Dudley Moore. Okay. But 
I didn't really. It wasn't great. I I didn't love it. I feel like I probably have watched a ton of stuff that I'm just not thinking of, but I'm reading, you know, the My Pillow guy? No. Mike Lindell. You don't know, like you've never seen the My Pillow? Mm -mm. Oh my God, you have to Google that. The Mike Lindell is this guy who makes these like stupid pillows and he used to be a crackhead. Whoa. <laughs> and so like he wrote this book that's called What Are the Odds from Crackhead to CEO? And he's this crazy Trump supporter guy and stuff and like me and my friend want to make this movie about him where he since he was a crackhead it's just like the movie is basically wait hold it don't have to be so badly okay (laughs) sorry i was trying to listen and i was like i need to listen i'm gonna be right back also okay so you want to make a movie about the crackhead man Oh, you're gone. Like, obviously, if you were a crackhead, like, you would want to, you would probably have fantasies about pillows, too. Why is that? Because you can't sleep. Oh. Like, you're a crackhead. You know? (laughs) So, like, what would be the perfect pillow for me to actually sleep? Yeah, so that's basically the premise of the movie. It's the crackhead dream of pillow? Yeah. But we just were joking about this and like kind of talking about how we wanted to like write the script and stuff. So my friend bought me like his actual biography mm. and like the cover of it is him as a crackhead and then it's like a hologram. <laughs> and if you like move it a different way, it's like him as like a happy Christian CEO. Uh, oh, so it, like, whoa. Cool. Did you read uh, Joan Didion's uh, Your Magical Thinking yet? No, I haven't read it okay. yet. I started reading the crackhead book. Let me know what you thought of that, the Joan Didion, when you get to it. I guess I'm reading Chicago by David Mamet. That's a novel. Pretty darn fun so far. It's almost, almost done with it. It's good. It's like a, it's like a noir <laughs> mystery. It's what you would expect a novel by David Mamet to be like, which is not what other novels by David Mamet are like. They're more like experimental and strange. This is more like what a movie or something like him is like with flim flams and lots of dialogue and there's a mystery and stuff. And it's a lot of fun. I think that's all I got. Any idea you want to watch Broken Arrow next time or something else? Yeah, let's do that one. Okay.